The assumption that everything humans do necessarily hurts the environment is a powerfully seductive belief for many Westerners who harbor angst over the myriad and amazing ways humans have found to rearrange the raw materials of the earth to suit our needs. Our cars and planes and machines and gadgets and conveniences are all very nice, but they also complicate our lives. We sometimes yearn for simpler times, a bygone era when life was less hurried. Yet that way of life has not been relegated to the dustbin of history. It is still lived by more than one billion people on the earth today who have no electricity, no refrigeration, no clean water, and who must gather wood and animal dung to use for heating and cooking. For these people, and for the vast majority of the human beings that have ever lived, life on this planet has been dirty, smelly, difficult, and short. So what has raised people out of this mean and meager way of life? Energy. In fact, everything humans do requires energy. Communication, transportation, medicine, even growing food. And the primary sources of that energy today are carbon-based fossil fuels. The trouble is that while our lives have been improving, our atmosphere has also been getting warmer. The obvious question is, why? Many scientists claim that the warming is the result of our use of fossil fuels. In the case of climate change hysteria, the argument goes something like this. Burning of fossil fuels produces carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas. Greenhouse components in the atmosphere reduce the rate at which the Earth cools to outer space through infrared radiation. Now we've been releasing more and more carbon dioxide and the atmosphere has been getting warmer and warmer. The answer must be that the two events are related. But of course, correlation does not always mean causation. Are there alternative explanations for recent warming that would relegate the impact of humans to the level of noise? Yes, there are. Have scientists adequately ruled out these other possible explanations for recent warming? No, they have not. Before global warming became the most popular climate research topic, most of the evidence that had been published over the years suggested that periods of natural global warming and cooling are the rule, not the exception. A number of indirect measures of past temperature, so-called temperature proxies, suggests that it might well have been warmer during some decades around 1000 AD, during the medieval warm period, than it has been recently. And since most of that warming, including retreating glaciers at the end of the Little Ice Age, occurred well before fossil fuel use could be blamed, there are indications that there are natural climate variations at work which are as yet not well understood. While it is true that modern science has ruled out the most obvious direct influences on the climate system, like changes in sunlight intensity or ozone depletion, scientists have essentially ignored natural indirect sources of climate change generated by the climate system itself. The reason why is that we have not sufficiently detailed and accurate global observations of the climate system over a long enough period of time to understand the role of Mother Nature in causing climate change. You cannot study that which you do not have the data to study. For instance, the most recent period of warming that started in the late 1970s might have been mostly caused by a 1 or 2 percent decrease in global average cloudiness due to a natural internal climate cycle. Sufficiently accurate global satellite data to document such a change, though, has only existed for about the last 10 years. Now, if it does turn out that past warming is mostly natural in origin, then it takes a much stronger push to cause warming than just an increase in CO2 levels, which indicates a robust, insensitive climate system. In that case, the natural warming can be expected to end at some point, and little additional warming from our greenhouse gas emissions would then be expected later. Since it has not warmed in the past 10 years, as most scientists expected it would, this is evidence that scientists have overestimated the role of carbon dioxide in climate change. The fact is, scientists and politicians alike have been too quick to assume causation when it comes to climate change. Like ancient tribes of people who made sacrifices to the gods of nature, 
Modern societies are too easily convinced that they are the ones responsible for weather changes and that they can somehow atone for their environmental sins through changes in behavior. And this happens to be very convenient for politicians and profiteers who are intent on regulating global energy use for their own power and financial gain. If global warming is in fact man-made, and if the dire predictions of Al Gore and his friends are to be believed, and all of this warming is indeed a threat to life as we know it, then what we really need are drastic reductions in our production of carbon dioxide in the coming decades, say at least 50% reductions by 2050. But where will those reductions come from? Solar and wind are two diffuse and intermittent forms of energy requiring huge tracts of land to generate the same amount of energy as a single coal-fired or nuclear power plant. Hydroelectric power is attractive since it has essentially no greenhouse gas emissions. Environmental concerns, though, are not only blocking the construction of new hydro dams, they are leading to the removal of some of the existing ones. Now, nuclear power is a particularly compact form of stored energy, but the disposal of spent fuel and safety concerns continue to prevent widespread acceptance of nuclear energy, especially in the United States. The bottom line is this. Not only is green energy still relatively expensive, it cannot meet a substantial fraction of our energy needs. In total, solar, wind, hydro, and nuclear provide less than 15% of all the energy used in the United States, which means that the huge sums of extra money the government takes from you to spend on these systems is almost all paying for no measurable gain. Meanwhile, carbon taxes, or the hidden carbon tax that is known as cap and trade, only hurt consumers by taking more and more money out of your pocket. They will destroy wealth, increase the price of virtually everything, drive industries overseas where they can pollute even more, and substantially grow government and greatly restrict personal freedoms. Which leaves us with only one immediate and effective way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to simply cease all economic activity all commerce in the world. To return to that mean and meager state from which carbon-based energy delivered us in the first place. Dirty, smelly, difficult, and short lives. So what is the answer? If there is even an actual human-caused climate problem, which as of yet remains mostly conjecture, well, to the extent that it actually exists, anthropogenic global warming is a slow process. Even if we assume that the current predictions of a sensitive climate system are correct, the average future warming rate is expected to be little more than two hundredths of a degree Celsius per year. So why is it that there is such a strong push to act now? Why do politicians keep claiming we have only a few years left to save ourselves, or that the latest UN meeting is, once again, our last chance to avert global disaster? Instead, why not simply allow time and the efficient forces of supply and demand, human ingenuity, and the power of the free market to innovate technological alternatives far beyond those we have currently created. And if it turns out that the climate system is in fact robust and insensitive, then destroying our engine of wealth creation and reducing civilization back to its pre-industrial roots will have been for nothing. 